Uh, hello, everyone. This is um, Capital Discussions, and this is our market analysis. Today is uh, March 9th. Uh, Capital Discussions is not a broker-dealer or an investment advisor. The presentation and discussion day are for educational purposes only. We don't know your situation, have no way of knowing what level of risk is appropriate for you. Uh, none of the trades talked about today should be considered to be recommend, uh, recommendations. Uh, the risk of loss in trading options is substantial, so please be aware of all of your risks prior to play, placing any trades. Uh, any Greeks or other computer simulated trades that we discuss are believed to be accurate, uh, but they are only um, a back test or they are also, um, um, I lost my place here. Uh, they're simulated so uh, with the software, so there's no way that we can end up knowing if they're accurate or not. Uh, with that, uh, welcome, um, Jerry. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, Hamanchu and I were just talking a little bit beforehand about everything that's been going on in this uh, market. Um, Friday's numbers were a little bit scary. I know the unemployment, and I know that uh, you share um, uh, the same um, viewpoint of uh, the Department of Labor and Statistics that, that I do. Uh, so I'll let you end up getting into that a little bit. But quite a big sell-off on Friday. Um, we had a little bit more of a sell-off, okay, a, a rebound at the very end of the day on Friday. Um, we opened up not very positive, but then had a huge run-up today, only to be followed by a, you know, late afternoon drift down. I wouldn't call it a sell-off. Um, are we finally going to start getting some two-way markets here? When, you, when you're looking at stuff, Jerry, you know, it's a... Uh, without, uh, you know, we talked beforehand, Jerry and I did, about everything that's been going on with the uh, uh, quantitative easing around the world, the whole Greek debt situation, uh, you know, some of the uh, factors that are driving currency changes um, because of the quantitative easing and the shape of economies in different countries. Um, so what I thought oh, I ended up asking Jerry to do is uh, basically um, – you know, to kind of walk us through what are some of the key factors that, that he looks at. I mean, you guys heard me probably at nauseum at this point. Uh, so I wanted to end up getting, uh, you know, some, some new viewpoints. Um, Jerry, tell me, what do you end up looking at in an environment like this? Uh, well, one of the screens that I have that I'm always watching is what I call my three by three grid, and it's uh, it's a screenshots on with multiple time frames uh, tabs, I should say. So on one screen, I'm looking at the euro, the pound, dollar, sure. yen. Can, can I can I make you the presenter? Could you share with us? So you show us? Yeah, sure. Uh, and I even took some screenshots just in case we end up with delaying internet issues. Okay, tell me what, uh, okay, it looks like you guys can see my screen. Okay, so let's go ahead and slideshow from beginning. Hang on, we're not seeing anything yet. Have you hit share? Uh, I thought I did. Hold on a second. Uh, da -da -da -da. Come on now. Yeah, I thought you, uh, where's my... If you end up going to um, uh, the, uh, I'm on an Apple, but I know if you go down and click on the Cisco WebEx Event Center. Right, okay, share my screen, monitor one, monitor two. There we go. All and right, very good. And now we see the, uh, you got three monitors there. Okay, now we see the TA uh, chart patterns. Okay, great. Let me go ahead and go ahead from beginning. All right. So here, uh, one of the things I saw a really nice chart picked us up off of uh, zero hedge. I don't know where they got it from. Uh, I'm watching technical analysis all day long. I do watch the fundamentals, um, but the three by three grid that I was telling you about. This is the live shot right here, and what you could see up here on the top, I have, uh, I don't know if you can zoom in or maximize your screen, these tabs right here, right now this is set to a 30 minute chart, and I've got one hour daily, weekly, monthly, and I can even customize like I'm watching gold 
Uh, and uh, so most of these charts are all on the XAU. Uh, but right now, most of the time I'm watching this out of the corner of my eye, 30-minute chart. Uh, I'll drop down, possibly down to tick charts. And these are live tick charts, futures charts. Uh, what we have up on the top row is the euro US dollar, the pound US dollar, and the dollar yen. Underneath that, we've got the dollar index, oil, gold. And then underneath that, on the bottom row, we've got the S&P 500, the Dow, and the NASDAQ. And if I switch this from the tick charts to a 30-minute screen, look at the correlations. If everything in the world is now so interconnected, uh, I'm not sure if people are aware that uh, the uh, CME is looking to go to futures trading uh, on the CBOE, because the Merck bought out the CBOE, so the CBOE for options on futures are going to start trading at 3 o'clock in the morning soon. And uh, my anticipation is that within about three years or so, we'll probably have something close to a 24-hour options market, uh, because it's all about volume. Uh, the more people that can trade it, the more volume there is, the more money that these for-profit exchanges can make. So uh, the key thing here is take a look up here. The euro, notice the spike down here as the dollar index goes up. And as the dollar index goes up, look at the spike down in the S&P 500, which is also reflected over here in the, in the Dow, which is also reflected in the NASDAQ. And isn't that interesting that as the NASDAQ goes down at the same spot, look at gold goes down also at the same time. And look by surprise, what a coincidence. The dollar is going up against the yen at the exact same moment. And oil, oil is, uh, oil is in play. So the concept is there are times, uh, and I've been doing this for a long time, when the correlations are extremely correlated, like we have right now, except what's in focus? Oil. Oil is the big picture that I'm watching, uh, and it's wiping out a lot of expectations. Uh, as to uh, some people just thought we were going to be at $100 oil heading slowly higher at 140 and some people are very, very surprised that we're at 40 some odd dollars now. Uh, so that's one thing that I watch. Uh, going back very briefly to my quick PowerPoint, and I'll just spend a couple of seconds on each Terry, slide. If I could, just one comment about the correlation. Sure. Um, you know, one of the things that's happened is that um, I've known different um, hedge funds, for example, like, you know, ETF arbitrage funds that basically cannot make any money anymore because the high-frequency guys keep those correlations so tight that they there's never any room uh, for them to end up uh, squeezing in. The high-frequency guys were willing to end up doing this uh, for fractions of a penny where, where people used to make dollars, but they're looking at doing it, you know, millions of times, you know, an hour. So, so they're, they're so tight. Well, well, that's a great point. And one of the slides I was going to show was how I was heavily involved in the spot currency game until until the CFTC NFA changed the rules. And so here on Option View, which I'm a, I'm a big avid Option View user, uh, you know the FXE ETF has huge open interest, trades a lot. The FXB for the British pound, FXY for the yen, FXC for Canadian dollar, FXI for China. Okay, what I found out a long time ago, and whether you're trading currencies, futures, or options, I think that the longer, the more time that you have in your positions, so let me go back to the correlation charts, instead of looking at a 30-minute chart, if I'm looking, let's, let's say, at my weekly charts, these patterns, look at, look at gold, for example. I mean, my eyes, I'm so trained on this, doing this for years. I, I see the triangle right here, clearly. Uh, the, Can you draw it? Oh, you absolutely. Draw it for, yeah, for those people that sure. are, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I mean, the thing is, other people's eyes aren't as trained as yours, or I, I saw it also, but it's uh, very easy for 
Right. Uh, but others, I want to have the other people understand what, what they're doing too. Right. And not only do you have that, but notice once I draw a top to a top, that creates a trend line. And charting patterns like this allow me to quickly go ahead and copy and duplicate the line. And that's when I can start to see symmetry. Okay. And then once you have a triangle, you have... Yes. I just want to point out, right? take a look at that top line. You had that, that trend line, but then it, it went down, and even though it was well below it, it came right back to it again until mm -hmm. it finally broke it, okay, around, uh, you know, the first week in, in 2015, and now it looks like it might, might end up acting as support. Exactly. Let's go ahead. Let me go ahead. And now that, now that you can see, in fact, let's go ahead real quick as long as, you know, a quick little TA, uh, TA progression. Um, so here's one more line here. So the trend is your friend until the end, right? So if we go ahead and copy that, notice that here we have the outer trend channel, then the inner trend channel over here, okay, until it broke that trend channel to the downside. But let's go ahead and, and that's all in the past. One of the things that I, I don't I, I, it's, I'm, a, I'm a technical analysis snob. It's easy to go ahead and draw lines what happened in the past. What about what's happening into the future? And that's what it's all about. So here we have at the right edge of the chart, we have once again another triangle, not the same type, but I'm looking for symmetry. I'm looking for uh, something that's extremely well formed. So I'm looking for at least one, two, three, four, five touches to make a triangle. And once I have those... You have another one, you have a six and seven. And that, that makes it even stronger. So it's coiled up like a snake, which, by the way, my neighbor across the street was, was killing some type of a snake yesterday living in Florida. We have these things. But once it's coiled up like a snake, it's, it's dangerous. It's not, you don't necessarily know, is it going to break to the upside or is it going to break to the downside? Uh, I've, we see we've got about 30 people in the room. Quick, quick show of hands or type it in. Who thinks gold's going up? Type in up. Who thinks gold's going down? Type in down. Let's see if we get any kind of uh, member participation here. We got down, down. Some people think gold's going down for the count. Okay, very good. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Dino. Okay, so uh, so it, it, we I I I am looking at chart patterns, high probability patterns, uh, and so the concept of the high frequency traders stealing the floor traders lunch absolutely true there are no more floor traders if you take a look on cnbc you'll see these guys in blue suits with kgt or whatever uh, those are the guys who work for the high frequency firms making sure the computers are plugged in properly um, but if you're going to trade off a weekly chart or a daily chart like here let's drop this down to a daily chart okay here so on a daily chart uh, Ba -ba -da. Here we go. Let's click and so here is the top of that trend channel there. We've got the top of this trench, bottom of this trend channel here. This what this looks like a stronger trend channel here. And if I go ahead and copy that, what I always like to do is see, will this copy? By copying, by, by drawing one set of lines and it touches, is it going to be symmetrical? And so for the most uh, yeah, part, yeah. it's kind of it's kind of close. It's kind of close. Uh, and then, of course, we have to draw the trend channel from the other side. Gold is in play, guys. I mean, uh, I put on an adjustment to a trade in gold on Friday. I recorded a video of my frustration as uh, GLD is a, you know, penny, it's a penny increment option. And damn, if those guys didn't want to give me, the bid was nine by, uh, I sold I sold a spread, I sold a vertical, and the one, the side that I sold for 75 cents, I was looking to get out of that at about 10 cents. But I wanted my nine cents, 
and it was trading eight by ten, and damn if they wouldn't give me nine cents. And I've, I had the same trade in two different accounts, and I and I was just pointing my order to the CBOE. I was pointing it to the box. I was I was pointing it to that nice and and I know those guys finally said, just give him his damn penny. And uh, so uh, it's amazing. Uh, are, your, answer, your question is so complex. Uh, are the high frequency traders stealing people's money? Yes, if you're trying to day trade. If you're looking at these types of charts, the daily and the weekly charts, and if you have solid price targets, such as uh, here's a chart of the IWM that I had done for you guys a while back on a daily, and uh, Yahoo's a great example. Um, got a client that I'm working with who's got tons of options in Yahoo, and you know, am I worried about the intraday, you know, ticks? No. I mean, some of the stocks, you know, that I work with, some other people work with, they've got unbearably large spreads that I would never day trade with, you know. Uh, so that's a big answer. Do have the high frequency traders taken away the fun? Yes. If you want to try to day trade, I think that it's been it's always been dangerous because you're in the you're in the tall tall grass with the big dogs and there's lots of snakes in there too. So to me, I like taking longer term positions. The more time I have, the more time I have to adjust my positions uh, and and maneuver, uh, especially in these markets. How's that? Well, we've seen we've seen similar stuff. Like for example, you know, I don't know if you've ever watched any of Hamanchu's stuff, but but um, in his shorter term trades in his income um, calendars, uh, there tends to end up being a lot more uh, gamma risk because of how much things can end up moving around. Uh, his longer term trades, his wealth trades, where there's a much um, uh, many more days to expiration, and also the options have a much higher percentage of overlap. You know, if he's uh, doing a three-month and a four-month option, there's a 75% overlap. They tend to end up moving a little bit slower. And what, what we've seen as longer-term options traders is that um, what's worked better is usually giving trades more time to let some of this high-frequency noise play itself out and then let more of the longer-term trend end up working. Hamantu, is, is, that, is that a fair assessment? Yes, indeed. So, so, so we, we we're seeing the same thing, and it, it makes a lot of sense what you're going through, uh, Jerry. Thank you. You're welcome. And by the way, Hamanchu, yeah, I've seen a little bit of uh, of your presentations, and uh, just to let you know, I I took uh, Woody's trade along three times, and oh. so uh, I know Ken pretty well. Uh, it's so unfortunate that he was so tied to the hip with uh, uh, with PFG. PFG. Yeah. And uh, but anyway, you know, those guys they really believe in their CCI indicator. It's very. It's very intricate, and I think that the CCI, Woody CCI indicator is excellent. Uh, I think one of Ken's sayings was, we're trying to get in one tick ahead of the rest. Yes. One bar, one bar, ahead, of, uh, one bar ahead of everybody else. And you got the slingshot trade, you got the, what was that, the killer whale trade, I forget. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the Shamu. Shamu, yes. That used to be called uh, the Famir trade once. Yes, after the good doctor, yeah. And so that's a very good, solid indicator that you're using there, uh, especially if you do want to day trade. Most of those people are doing um, uh, day trading. Yes. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I'd love to talk to you, uh, find out how you're applying that to the longer-term charts. Okay, sure. We'll be talking so, more about that uh, quite a few times, actually. So. Okay, great. So real quick, just want to go ahead and show you. This is a 30-second chart of Apple after they did their presentation on their uh, on their new iWatch presentation. And it doesn't matter what time frame it is. It doesn't matter what symbol it is. We have double tops. We have an M pattern. We've got a channel here with the flag pattern. Uh, we've got just good old solid support and resistance, you know. And 
close uh, closed, losing $17 billion in market cap. How about that? And as far as my concern, this is my concern. I took a snapshot real quick. This is what I think about the iWatch. Instead of having the police go ahead and monitor your whereabouts and your, uh, and, and your vitals, now you're going to go out and spend a few hundred dollars. Uh, it'll be the latest fashion device, and God forbid you got a pacemaker and the government doesn't like you, they'll be able to turn it off or whack it out. Um, <laughs> that's my, that's just my little uh, uh, three cents as far as uh, the iWatch goes. Uh, and, uh, wow, I thought I was cynical. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess we just got to get with the program, right? Um, as far as the correlations go, the currencies, you know, I really love the ETFs. You get some good dollar volume in the options. The spreads are uh, the spreads are sometimes large, but that's because you're dealing in in something that's got a large movement potential, and that's why you need to, in my opinion, and the way I use it is on a higher time frame, looking at daily, weekly, even monthly time frames. Uh, this is something I wanted to show Jim and everybody. I used to be heavily involved, and I was an invited speaker to the Traders Expos. This goes back 2006. Uh, they just had the Traders Expo last week up in New York. Why they do it in February in New York, I don't know. But this was the stage I was on. They had Larry McMillan there in the morning. Tom Sosnoff was on before me. And then I was, there I am right there. So I thought that this was pretty cool. I was sharing the stage with Larry McMillan, Tommy, and and, and there I am there. Any reason why, why um, McMillan was green and Sazoff was red? And I you were just, young? Uh, I, picked, I, I picked those colors. I did that myself. Okay. I just didn't know if it had a meaning. <laughs> yeah. For the, for the people who are watching this with the sound off, yeah. And uh, let's see. I took a snapshot of just in case you end up with, uh, I've been doing webinars since 2006. I uh, used to be a broadcaster for FX Street, and I've experienced internet failures and charting slowdowns, and so I'm a big believer in backups. And so uh, this is just a screenshot from this afternoon on a 30-minute chart. Uh, and here, this is something uh, I talked to you about this morning, Jim. Jim was talking about the Bureau of Labor uh, and Statistics, or otherwise Bureau of Lies and Statistics. Uh, with the earning, with the job numbers, and personally, uh, this uh, screenshot. Greek, look at the headlines. Greek leaders offers to quit. ECB official defends central bank's balance sheet. The Greek fears send the stocks tumbling. The ECB warns that there could be a contagion risk in the eurozone. Okay, Ireland warns that they're going to start cutting their rates. Okay, but the date, June fifteenth. 2011. Okay, this is what happened at that point in the summer of 2011. We had ten trillion dollars of money that was obliterated. This was a presentation that I had done live in Fort Lauderdale at the time in 2011, and these are uh, just huge, huge moves, uh, and we're seeing those moves now. Uh, this is also a screenshot of the VIX from August of 2011. This is a weekly chart. And these uh, VIX spike levels are still valid, where I consider this is, uh, this, this is September 11th. Surprisingly, the tech crash, uh, the second tech crash of 2000, summer 2002, uh, hit about 49 or so, 48. Uh, the fall of 2008, that was where uh, uh, the HARP, was it the HARP? Not HARP, TARP. Uh, they got $800 billion in reserves to prop up the banks because they were afraid of bank runs. Uh, so that, that hit a VIX of about 89. Um, and then you had the flash crash right here. And so notice, uh, notice the resistance levels. Uh, those are what I still consider to be uh, all-time historic points in the VIX. Uh, and then I took a screenshot, or do I have the VIX? Let me show you live chart of the VIX. Oops, I didn't want to do that. Uh, here we go. No, that's Yahoo. VIX. 
All right, so here's the VIX. So here's a live chart. That was from 2011. Here's live. And notice that we had a spike back here in October, the end of last year. Things started to get a little bit uh, scary. But you know what? Is it scary? I mean, uh, what I look at is that all of this is just institutional rebalancing. And you've got, uh, you know, people go on vacation, sell in May, go away. September, you end up typically seeing people get back to work between September and Thanksgiving. And what I've noticed is what I, I'm always looking at patterns. What I see are patterns of threes on the VIX. Notice I see one, two, three spikes here. It comes down, starts up again. Notice one, two, three spikes here. It doesn't matter. These are fractal patterns is what I call it. Uh, they kind of gather together. Here you've got, after we got the one, two, three spike here, it comes down. Then you kind of got these three little spikes. What it looks like to me is we have one, two, and I'm looking for one more spike to the upside uh, that could come in at any time. Uh, and of course, Past performance is not indicative of future results, but uh, but just watch this level here because that's a Fibonacci cluster right here at about 40, 40.8. So uh, what do I mean by a Fibonacci cluster? I've drawn from this bottom, if you look at the bottom where I'm moving this line, from that bottom where we have several bottoms to that all-time high, okay, Notice that that correlates with this point right here, which is from this high right here down to this low right here. Okay, so there's the high to the low, and here's the low to the high. And notice that there's, you know, to make it easier to see, those two fibs are overlapping. And so that is your danger point. If we get above that 41, 42 area, then you're looking at extreme fear. And I don't feel comfortable selling selling or buying VIX products because it's a derivative of a derivative, but that's just my opinion. Uh, but I wouldn't want to sell any VIX products till it gets up around here uh, because you never know when it could all of a sudden go higher. Uh, real quick, a couple of more slides and from current slide. Blow off tops once again. Uh, oil, silver, gold. Notice they all have the same characteristic patterns, where they consolidate, go up, consolidate, go up, and then spike. And these were all screenshots just before they crashed. Uh, okay, so that was first. I showed you the Greeks back in 2011. These are screenshots from over the weekend. This is from Bloomberg. Uh, there's a video, and I took screenshots for everybody. Stop austerity, support Greece, change Europe. That's one screenshot at 3 minutes and 25 seconds. Uh, then there's another one, cracks are in Greece's deal with the creditors. And do the Greeks want their dignity? I think everybody wants their dignity and sovereignty, but the problem is that Germany and all of the creditors and Goldman Sachs, they want their payments made on time. And so the Greeks have been made into slaves. Uh, they've been forced to borrow money to pay their debts. And so uh, it's kind of like just, they're kind of like crack addicts that keep getting, keep getting more and more credit to keep paying their dealer. Uh, I'll and apologize to all of the Greeks right now on the call. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, yeah, uh, this is from the Sunday Times. Uh, Europe's going to reject uh, Greeks' plan. They wanted to actually plant um, spy equipment on fake tourists to try to make sure that the Greeks are paying their taxes because uh, the Greeks are just you know they don't want to play along with the game. Yeah. So, by the way, just a you know a couple of quick comments there. Um, Greece, um, Greece does have a very high percentage of uh, family-owned businesses, uh, which tend to end up having a much lower tax rate than some of the corporations. Um, and you can go through a lot of different ways, but the bottom line is that there's a lot of unrest because uh, you know if you view this uh, from the point of uh, of Germany, and you guys know that that. Uh, Tom um, um, Tom Nunnemaker lives in Germany. 
is that the viewpoint from the Germans are uh, they are they are a bunch of hard working individuals. The Germans are, and they're working so hard so that the Greeks can retire at 55 and sit on the beach. And there's animosity that has been building up. Um, the fact that the Greek government has overspent. Uh, some of the, the the population feels that that uh, they, that isn't really their issue. Why are they being punished so hard? So there are going to be feelings that are hurt no matter what happens. I don't see how this can end up ending well. And if it doesn't end well, uh, you know, some of those um, points of, of resistance uh, and support and some of the charts that, that uh, Jerry just showed you on the VIX, I think are going to be very, very much in play. And you should keep an eye on those things because right, we obviously don't get there unless there's some type of catalyst in the market to end up driving it. And one of the things that we have to end up being aware as, as you know, money managers is how serious are these um, you know, instant, uh, the, the, the current news cycle, how, how serious are the current issues? One of the things that I will end up telling you that is not measured on any of the technicals that retail folks end up taking a look at, but, but we look at all the time from an institutional point of view is that we'll not only look at the level of volatility, but what's important for us also is to look at the level of skew. Those below the money puts, right now are trading at a very rich premium to the at the money puts. In fact, when we were rolling some of our hedge protection over the last month or so, we were we got up to one point, we got up to a three standard deviation. Okay, 99% okay, percentile of how expensive the below the money puts were versus the at the money puts. So when you end up seeing this and, and Jerry goes through hey, here's where volatility levels can get to. Um, it's not that far-fetched. If we have a catalyst, I will tell you that the markets, okay, the institutional money is already kind of gearing up for what happens if. So there may be some great opportunities. So, you know, that's why I thought it was so important to end up bringing Jerry on and having him to talk. And, you know, hopefully he'll be able to end up joining us a lot more in the future where we're going to go over the technicals because I think that you're going to have just some great directional plays, okay, going forward. Very good, right. Any questions? Uh, you know, I don't know if uh, Hamanchu wants to go ahead and, uh, and, and take, take it from here or any, uh, look at Netflix, was that, that Netflix? Uh, actually, uh, Jerry's uh, giving some very important details, details that I rarely look at. <laughs> so if you want to continue, go right ahead, because I don't look at the macro view at all. Jerry, uh, maybe, you know, I don't know if you want to end up taking a look at it. Uh, um, VJ ended up uh, saying that Greece had defaulted, okay, on its external sovereign debt, okay, and he gives some of the years. Um, it's, it's unbelievable, by the way, when you take a look at how frequently in history Okay, some countries uh, either in South America or in, uh, I'm going to say more Southern Europe, have defaulted on their debt. Uh, it's not like it is not a once in a century. It, it actually happened many, many times. One of the things that I think is a little bit more, um, you know, I guess worrisome is, is, first of all, it's happening while we have money in the market. I mean, let's start with that. But also the whole concept of having sovereign having sovereignty, okay, for each of the countries, but yet when you end up having this intertwined monetary system, um, you're going to end up, you know, you can't just keep borrowing money, okay, without there being repercussions. And right now, you know, there are, I think, so, some real, real issues. Um, are there Venezuela? Okay. <laughs> Yes, Terry. Okay, I didn't want to end up going into there, but but they 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 you know Argentina, okay, Russia, okay. Yes, they, 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 there's many of them. Um, you want to end up, uh, and I'll put this out to the audience, okay? If you guys, do you want to end up having Jerry look at, at some currencies? Would you like him to go back and look at Apple? Um, I'm I'm kind of a uh, interesting. Um, yeah, you know, I'd be kind of interested. I know a lot of people have. Uh, 
have been trading Apple, okay, on our in our community. You started mentioning, okay, what was going on in the 30-minute, okay, Apple. Were you done on that? Because I know you kind of just went through that really quick. Was there anything else uh, you wanted to, to kind of show us on either that? Or is there a more interesting chart you'd rather share? Well, uh, I wanted to go ahead and uh, I tuned in a few times uh, as participant, uh, you know, and also and as an observer. I wanted to kind of get a feel for you know, from you and the crowd, what are some of the things that you guys would want to see? Uh, you know, I do watch, this is the global market all the time. I'm trying to figure out what may be leading the market. Uh, and then I also drill down, uh, I'm using uh, lots of different charting programs, probably five different charting programs. Uh, I liken it to, uh, in fact, I'm doing a live presentation later uh, in the month and here in Fort Lauderdale. And some of my slides are that sometimes free stuff is good, cheap stuff is good, but uh, and, and sometimes it's that those those three by three grids are are free. Uh, but you get what you pay for. Other times, you know, you want to go out and you want to buy real solid institutional tools. Uh, uh, is, you know, sometimes like option view for decision support. So, I mean, I can go ahead and drill down on a chart uh, on a stock. Uh, if you want to uh, have a contest, Jim, and, and see maybe uh, – who wants to have a stock of the day or st of the Monday stock pick, and I can go ahead and drill down and and then come out and and maybe see what Option View tells me and how I would look at that. Uh, I, I, don't, I would love to end up doing, uh, doing that, but but you know for this one, is there? A, a, I'll, I'll put. I'll give you a choice. Is there anything okay that you've been looking at that's real interesting from a chart perspective? If not, uh, you showed Apple before. Would you want to end up talking about Apple if you just want somebody to end up picking? Because of their iWatch and what's happened recently, I think that uh, um, that's an interesting okay uh, situation. All right, let's talk about Apple a little bit. One of my clients, I do private coaching and mentoring for select people who are adults and, and they know they're making their own decisions and I help them stay out of the weeds. Um, he's got a ton of Apple and uh, he just wants me to kind of make sure that I'm a second pair of eyes for him. So you can see the analysis work I do on Right, we also hedge. Um, not that we make recommendations or technical analysis, but for for some very large individuals and also on some money managers, we've built hedges for for Apple. Some folks are a little bit concerned about you know the uh, uh, will the iWatch be a new total format for folks. Uh, I, I know that the technology I wear on my wrist is oh, about a hundred years old. Um, and the technology that's going in the iWatch in some of these unbelievable cases will end up changing. What happens, you know, how frequently uh, have you, do you change your, your phone compared to your watch? I know that cell phones were like um, practically new when I ended up buying my watch, um, you know, and I've had it for 20 years. So, so how, you know, what, will they end up changing the face of that? If so, what ends up happening? The, the, the law of large numbers, does it keep up? Um, you take a look at how much they've grown and just how big a company they are. And at what pace will they have to end up continuing to integrate to end up keeping the multiples that they trade at? I mean, these are all really, really good things. And one of the things that we found is that you can do all of the technicals and all of the analysis you end up wanting on this. The, uh, the, in terms of the fun, any fundamental or qualitative type um, um, analysis on them, it's almost always the technical that you have to follow to end up getting out of stuff. So that's why I would be really, really interested, Jerry, from what, what you end up seeing on the technical side, because I think that we'll see a breakdown in price in technicals in Apple long before we start to see anything about some of these items that I brought up or might be questions of Apple in the future. Believe me, um, you know, I thought, uh, I'm talking to you on my, you know, through my Apple Mac, okay, and I'm looking at my, my iPad and I have my, my you know, my, my 6 Plus, okay, on my phone. So I'm a big Apple fan, but I do worry about, you know, how we've come so far, how much longer can this great ride last? Mm -hmm. 
So if right now a conversation about Apple has to include what happened on Friday. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to a good, good friend of mine, Ken, who's he also ran a group up in Orlando for traders years ago. Um, he does a lot of crunching of numbers. And I don't know if anybody else out there has done this, but if we're going to talk about Apple, let's talk about what happened Friday. Dow went down 300 points plus, right? And what happened? AT&T, which I think is one of the few remaining original, it's not the original, I think only General Electric is the only original Dow component. That is true. Okay, but AT&T goes way back and uh, they're out. And I think that that was Apple that actually saved AT&T uh, when they were, uh, when Steve Jobs worked out the um, subsidy. Uh, you went to, uh, AT&T was the only network you could run your iPhone on. And, and so AT&T was happy to subsidize the $600. They probably got them for 300 bucks. Uh, and they got those clients for, for two years plus. That is no more. So uh, I like to drill down and drill up. Uh, sometimes when I'm, we're talking about time frames, whether it's a five minute daily and weekly charts, or if I'm talking about the Dow 30 and its subsectors or its individual components, and so what does it mean to Apple if it's going to get put into the Dow, which is a price-weighted index, and uh, also uh, correlation-wise or pairs trading-wise, uh, do you want to maybe even look at AT&T? Personally, I don't like $33 stocks. There's not much juice to them. Uh, very, you know, it doesn't, but, but you got a lot of volatility. You look at the AT&T stock. Um, so if I was going to ever day trade options, you know, for, you know, pennies, uh, you know, look at, you got a nice little, little trend channel here on AT&T. You got the cycles on my indicators here. Uh, and uh, Apple, what's going to happen to Apple? Apple is $127 stock. You know, I mean, they're, they're and and also, if we're going to talk about Apple, we also have to talk about IBM. Uh, at least that's the way I look at it, because uh, Jeannie and Jim and I share the fact that we both once upon a time worked for uh, international right. business machines, and uh, I think the only thing that uh, Ms. Ginny is. Uh, accomplished was getting into the what's that pro, the men's only golf club the masters or <laughs> masters yeah yeah I don't really and then she's she's actually like a little schoolgirl uh, ponying up to um, what's his name from Apple uh, and and IBM wants to sell Apple products uh, and and then also let's tie it all together Microsoft. Windows 10 is going to be coming out soon, and their big thing, the new CEO of, uh, of Microsoft, his job is riding on the fact that all of their components are supposed to be interconnected. And uh, Microsoft, which started out as an operating system company, is now moving more into a hardware company because they bought Nokia. And so watch your cell phone tablet, laptop, and desktop with Windows 10 seamlessly integrate, I guess, through the cloud. And so um, you, do have, you do have a pretty much of a, a technology battle looming. Uh, and, and technology battles for us option traders, anytime that there's a battle, that's volatility. And anytime you got volatility, you got, uh, you have, I, I love, I love high volatility. Um, it depends on your own personal preference. So, uh, uh, so that that's really you know think about it. Uh, major major tech titans, AT and T, IBM, Microsoft, and Apple. They are joined one way or another. Uh, if I just want to talk independently on Apple from a technical perspective. 
It's an obvious peak at 133.30. It's got itself coming down. It hit the 50 period moving average right here. And uh, it looks to me as if, or is that the 22? It came down to the 22 moving average. The 50 is at 118. So you've got support right here at about one, let's just round it up and say 120. If you're a believer in Apple, maybe you want to go ahead and, and this is not a recommendation, this is the way I always talk to my clients. If I uh, was somebody else and I was really interested in buying Apple stock, maybe I would consider finding out how much can I get for selling the 120 puts. Uh, if I thought that uh, the market and Apple's going to go down, maybe I would consider selling the 135 calls. How much juice can I get out of it? Uh, let's take a look at Apple. Right now I'm in back trader mode. How many people here like, uh, well I know that we've got what, Option Net Explorer, Option View, Thinkorswim's doing as good a job as they can, but they got years and years of development to catch up to, to Option View. Um, so if you were to go ahead and try to sell, let's say the 135s, do we have any juice up here? I, I like to, if I'm going to sell an option, I want to make sure I get at least 70 cents minimum. I've got a screenshot somewhere from uh, Jim Cramer's blog where they literally had the audacity to try to tell you that you could sell an option for three cents. I, I, I took a screenshot. I couldn't believe it. Um, so here, tw 19 days, you can collect 70 cents. 25 days, you can collect 98 cents if you think uh, Apple has reached a resistance level. I'm always checking. I know that Jim went into a beautiful conversation about implied volatility and term structure last week. That's out there in the archives. And um, I love the way Option View quickly gives me the percentile ranking. So 52 says that we're at a 50-50 uh, point as far as are the options cheap or expensive. Uh, you've always got to double check, make sure if there's any news scheduled to come out. So as much as of a technician I am, but I'm always checking the fundamentals. And real quick, just to tell you how uh, Finviz is always on my screen, beautiful site that's for free. And so it gives you a very good, quick, what I consider institutional snapshot uh, at a glance as far as, okay, earnings, January 27th, we don't have to worry about that. All the news that fits their profile, and then insiders, and so on for anybody who hasn't, hasn't played with Finviz. We, we could do a whole presentation on Finviz uh, if you want someday. Hey, someday I would like to end up that. You know, one of the things that I ended up doing in the covered call class is that I did a brief look at Finviz um, when I was taking a look at fundamentals. Um, I actually ended up in the covered call class. I actually spent time going through the um, American Association of Independent Investors, AAI. They have a, uh, a tool called Stock Investor Pro. And we went through that because it had a lot more um, capability. But for a fit, for a quick and dirty and free, nothing beats Finbis. Yeah, yeah. And it's, and it's anywhere in the world. No download, no password required. So that's what I like. Uh, same thing here, my three by three grids. They're free anywhere in the world. Uh, you can quickly go ahead and bring them up uh, and get a snapshot of the major what system was this again? This is actually, if you go to dailyfx.com, and uh, you have to go out to their free charts and then select the power charts. Uh, it's one of the, it's, you know, that's hit the replay button on the recording, dailyfx.com, go up to free charts, and then they have several, and select the power charts, and then you have to configure the workspace. It comes, it, it doesn't look like this when you first get it. You, you got to configure it.
Yeah, I'm you sure know, a lot of people would like to end up learning how to end up doing this, especially, okay, for free tools. I mean, it's a learning how to end up getting some of these things done, okay, with a, with no annual or monthly cost going forward is something that's very attractive to me and I, I know the rest of our community. Right, right. Yeah, just go ahead and email, uh, you know, Jim or me or, or Tom if you want to get in touch with me. I can give you directions how to, how to do that. Um, so going back to Apple, implied volatility, 50 percentile ranking. Um, I don't see any uh, events on the time horizon. What historically happens? to stocks once they're entered into the Dow. Surprisingly, they usually go down initially, uh, and, and then they end up grinding higher. Uh, you may also see more stock splits because the institutions, uh, uh, the institutions might want to offload to the retail public uh, and make it easier. It's interesting. I mean, you know, Apple's an expensive stock in a in a price weighted index. So, uh, so let me go ahead and why am I getting this? Hold on a second. Okay, close. Hold on. Here we go. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd love, you know, if I think that Apple really is peaked out, I mean, maybe looking at calendars. Uh, I think, is it Hamanshu you're doing calendars? Yes. Hamanshu is a calendar king. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, so, so, I mean, this is where, you know, my technicals kind of hand off. You know, first of all, you know, I look at, uh, you know, I look for price chart patterns or if I have a client that says I love XYZ stock, and even if I don't see a pattern, I'll go ahead and say, okay, so here's my resistance, 135. Here's my support at 120, very strong support. And so uh, then I, I would go ahead and drill down into option view uh, and help me select what I consider to be the best strategy based on my assumptions. I know that there was somebody here last week talking about the modeling and how the modeling is never always perfect. Uh, when you do go ahead and do projections, like if I was to go ahead and uh, uh, pull up one of my trades here, let me pull up on gold. I closed one side of my vertical and opened up another trade. And so the modeling here, even though it looks like it's a loser, it's already, a, it's a guaranteed winner because I already locked in one side of, of my vertical. Uh, oh, so you I took your profits up already. I, I, I lifted one leg and readjusted after it went, gold went down 40 some odd points on Friday. So uh, so I, I I bought back nine, for nine cents, you know, the side that I sold for 75, and then I went ahead and re-entered with another calendar here, and so uh, so this is my risk reward graph now. Uh, but all of this modeling is only based on my assumptions. You know, the computer it's a, the old garbage in, garbage out. Uh, <laughs> yeah. If I if I make an assumption and my assumption is wrong, uh, well, the computer can only tell me, you know, you know, what I was hoping to see. And that's why you got to have a plan. Uh, my plan is to use the right strategy at the right time based on what the charts are telling me. Uh, I know some people just love to write covered calls all day long or do iron condors all day long. And I think there's a time and a place for those strategies uh, I think there was someone else that did a presentation that said uh, high probability charts are just, hmm, maybe this one's going to work out. They'd rather have a plan, uh, a fixed strategy that that's what they do day in, day out. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think that it's excellent structure. Uh, but I love a high probability trade that I can risk a little bit of money to make a whole bunch and I can have a whole lot of losses and just the few times that I do do make it makes up for all the losers whereas I had one of my hardest losers 
last year or actually a year and a half ago now on I still love the stock. I don't go there. I don't want to pay ten dollars for a, a bag of beans and some chips. But it's a good bag of beans. It's a good, exactly. It's good food. I talked to some friends, and the mantra is good food. Chipotle is good food. Their business model is fantastic, and I just never thought that this stock on earnings would move 140 points in one day. It blew past three standard deviations. And uh, it's the last time I put on an iron condor. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. so. And by the way, one of the things I do want to just make a comment here, because I know we're coming up on an hour, and I'm going to give the ball back to you here in a second, Jerry, is that one of the things that I, I wanted to make sure, and the reason why I'd really like to have Jerry on more often, is that so much of our community are iron condor sellers. Uh, what ends up happening is that we keep making bets that the stock won't be moved so much and we'll collect our premium and be able to end up making money. One of the challenges that's happened in this environment is that we do get these rather sudden moves and because of the volatility skew that I mentioned before, the fact that the further you go below the money, and also it works on stocks like Chipotle, the further you go above the money, the higher volatility ends up getting, which means that if you're selling stuff closer to the money, you're, you're getting a lower IV, and if you're buying stuff further away from the money, like you would be in an iron condor, you're paying more. So what's happening is that the statistical advantage that we used to end up having by selling iron condors really doesn't exist anymore. If you guys go back and take a look at um, one of the roundtables that we did with Bill Visconto from EAB Investment Group, he went through a quantitative model that kind of ended up showing that. Now, there are great trading techniques think about Amy Meisner's, that can end up getting you through that, but you don't have the same statistical advantage. So unless you have some very specific, well thought out, well back tested risk management, uh, you have to be very careful on that. Jerry's approach is usually the opposite. Um, you've heard me use the word convexity. Okay, uh, and what when, when institutional guys talk about convexity, it, it's really about, how do we end up betting one to make five, but still end up winning, say, 40% of the time? You know, we, we know we're not going to end up being a 50-50 investor. And when you end up taking that approach kind of, and I don't know, you know, Jerry has di different models, but, but that concept of I don't mind losing a little bit, um, even if things end up gapping on me and see, you know, Nobody who's an iron condor seller likes to end up talking about what happened with Chipotle when you end up having that level of a gap, right? Nobody wants to end up talking about the level of a gap that we had in the Swiss francs a few months ago when a hedge fund down in Miami, a little bit south of us, ended up losing eight, right? They shut down their doors because they lost all of their $800 million in seconds because they basically had iron condors on the Swiss franc. Nobody wants to end up talking about those things. But when you end up having trades that have positive convexity, and you end up getting those levels of moves, you know, what Jerry's talking about is how do you end up really cashing in on those? So I think it's very healthy to have a portfolio that has a mixture, not just all one type of trades. I'm sorry, Jerry, but that's one of my pet peeves that I just had to end up getting out. Please continue. No, that's fine. That's good. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, it's just interesting talking about one of the things that I'll do if – if I feel like I want to go to Vegas, I'll go ahead, uh, and it's not so much, I hate the phrase, go to Vegas, but I mean here, this is a scanner I've got plugged in on Finviz. These are all the earnings coming out next week, and so I'm looking for high probability chart patterns, and it looks to me like I see a decent kind of a triangle trend channel with RSPP. One of the things that I would do is I'd open up uh, Option View take a quick look and plug in. First thing I look at is, okay, there's only 10, 10 points of what is it, daily volume of options. So there's no, there's no option, there's, there's no option trade in that stock. So I just go next. I don't even open up the asset file. Um, Chipotle Mexican Grill, uh, it just, I mean, take a look at this. I mean, was this it? Yeah, October 2013. The pain, the pain is real. It was trading at uh, 
it closed uh, before earnings, uh, well, 436. It, it gapped up to, it opened up at 470 and I was fine. I could have closed my trade out with a small profit, but the phone rang at 930, 925. I shouldn't have taken it. It's one of my clients. And instead of, instead of leaving the phone alone, I, I picked it up. By 10 o'clock, it just kept on running up. Notice here uh, an example of Fibonacci. Some people say Fibonacci's don't work. Um, notice how it hits those Fibonacci clusters and stops. Uh, does it happen every time? It, it gives me a price target. That's what it's all about. Uh, but I just, the pain, 440, it, it, it closed at 508. So I'm sorry, I just, I, and, and look how it does it again. It did it again to these people. It was trading at 500, earnings comes out the next day, uh, 650, 150 point move in one day. So will I go ahead and buy a 60 cent option on Chipotle Mexican Grill, directional to the upside? Maybe. Will I do an iron condor? Never again. <laughs> okay, guys, we've been going just about an hour. Jerry, do you have any, um, do you want to just kind of finish up on Chipotle or was that, do you have anything else you wanted to mention on them? I just wanted to do some uh, uh, psychotherapy in public. That's all. I know. I, 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 I didn't want to say that, but you know, if you're going to do that any longer, I'm going to have to charge you for sitting on our couch. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I said the subject you to it. it so, but, but remember, the, the whole idea is that if you can learn from other people's mistakes, you know. That's so, what it is. Is it? It really is. It's you know what this is about. It's sharing sharing battle scars because you always learn a lot more. Hey guys, um, I was just looking at some of the comments, some of the things that we started to end up seeing here. Um, what I would love to end up doing is that um, Hamanchu has been trading the IBM calendars for those of you that have been following along with him and he's been doing it, uh, Hamanchu, for as long as I've known you, for, for a decade I know you've been trading IBM calendars. Um, I, I think you're the only one here. You didn't work for IBM, did you? No. <laughs> Jerry, Jerry that is why did. I trade IBM. <laughs> okay, Jerry and I did. Um, I will share this, okay, with IBM, and maybe we could take a look at them, okay, from a technical perspective, because I think they're actually a really good trading vehicle. Um, IBM, part of the Dow, has been the worst performing member of the Dow for the last two years running. The last company to earn that very prestigious, okay, distinction was Bethlehem Steel. <laughs> okay, it was funny, I ended up mentioning this in one conference, and somebody said, uh, who is Bethlehem Steel? I said, exactly. Okay. <laughs> okay. It was a younger kid. Okay. That's amazing. Anyway, so I'd like to end up going through that because, you know, the thing is that they did have some ugly gaps down. Um, I know a fair bit about th their current business model. Um, you know, the company that uh, I was in, IBM bought, I was I used to be a partner at PricewaterhouseCoopers, okay, and they're basically their consulting uh, arm these days. Uh, IBM is uh, known in the software industry, and I have a lot of friends in the software industry, is no, it's, it's got a nickname of the place where good software goes to die. Um, when you end up taking a look at what's going on with um, uh, the cloud, and how disruptive the cloud technology is. Um, IBM has uh, some great um, integration software, and they have some huge, huge outsourcing contracts. Uh, but I, I think that when you take a look at, for example, what Oracle's doing or uh, companies like Salesforce.com or Workday or others, there really is disruptive technology uh, going on. So I'd love to end up doing the technical space because it's not only an interesting space in terms of where the industry is, but with the technicals, I think that we're going to be able to end up getting some, uh, it's going to be a good trading vehicle. So if you guys would be available next week, I'd love to end up, after we do our overall what's going on in the market, I'd love to end up. Uh, bringing up IBM a little bit more, uh, if that's okay with you guys. Sure. Sure. In fact, yeah, if you want to go ahead and, uh, uh, you know, do that as an example, and if maybe you want to, you know, put some feelers out to your mailing list and see, uh, you know, who wants what stock to be taken a look at, and I'll be happy to maybe 
focus up for 20, 30 minutes. Uh, I can drill down, drill up, and go through option view, kind of show the whole process I go through. I would love that. And Hamanchu, I know because you trade the IBM calendars, maybe if we could end up getting, you know, 20, 30 minutes for, from you about how you end up going through it, uh, I'd really like to end up starting to end up doing this. And I know that Hamanchu is doing his service, and for a lot of you guys, uh, he's going to do this, um, um, you know, on his weekly stuff. But for the rest of you, I'd love for you to end up getting a peek into what Hamanchu does in his service. And Jerry, I, I'd really like it if we could end up doing more and more technicals. One of the things that ends up happening is that we need a way to figure out to end up getting you on more often because some of the things that I, I've, I've heard is that this stuff is so great, but you go through things so quickly that, that you know, I, I'd really love to be able to end up getting things in more detail. And maybe we can end up uh, thinking about that and talking to the folks next week about how we could end up accomplishing that. Absolutely. It sounds like a good idea. Um, let's uh, let's put it on my calendar for next Monday, and we'll talk about IBM, and uh, we'll talk in between. Good. Sounds great. And Hamachu, hopefully you'd be ready, you'd be available next Monday also. Yep, I will be. Guys, thank you so much. Great session. I really appreciate your time, and I know our community does also. <coughs> All right. Very good. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Jim. Lamanchu, yeah, be well. And that IBM, that looks like a great calendar trade. Uh, that thing's just gone. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it works even better when it goes straight down. <laughs> well, Guys, the thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, very it good. does look it does. We're, 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 we're going to go into it next week. Thanks, guys. Okay. All right, guys. See ya. Bye -bye. Thanks. All right. Over and out. Bye bye. Bye.